This video is the continuation of part two from our troubled debt modification question for Red Bank and Troubled Inc. So in the previous video, we finished part one, which was a lot of work. Let's take a look at part two. So using the same information as part one, now assume that Red Bank reduced the principal to 1.6 million rather than 1.9 million. On January 1st, 2024, Troubles, sorry, Troubles Inc. pays 1.6 million in cash to Red Bank for the principal. The market rate is currently 10%. Determine if Troubles can record a gain under this term modification. If yes, calculate the gain. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is determine if the economic substance of the debt renegotiation should be accounted for as a settlement or a modification of the old debt. So we need to use the cash flow test to figure out if the present value of the cash flow streams of the new debt are more than 10% different from the cash flow streams of the old debt. So let's take a look at how we're gonna do this. So we know that the old debt's cash flow stream, which was from up here, was this 2 million, okay? So we've got 2 million as our cash flow stream for the old debt. What are we gonna use as our cash flow for the new debt? So it says that Red Bank reduces the principal from to 1.6. Now, is 1.6 the present value of the new debt? No, it isn't. That's the face value of the new debt, but it isn't the present value. The reason that the 2 million was the present value of the old debt, just to refresh you from our previous question, was because it was issued at par. So we know that the 2 million was the actual present value, but we have no, this 1.6 million isn't being issued at, issued at par. Um, it's obviously different than par because the debt's been reduced because trouble is having problems. So we need to figure out what the present value of the new cash flow streams are. So let's take a look at that. Just scroll through all of our hard work from part one. And let's take a look. So let's put, let's look at part two. Part two. So we've got that old, the present value of the old debt or the debt before the change was 2 million, okay? Now, what's the present value of the new debt? We're gonna go, so we need to know present value. We've got I, N, payment, and future value. So what do we know here? Well, we know we know from the question that the, that the, the principal of the new debt has now been reduced to 1.6 million. Previously, we had 1.8 here. Originally, this would have been 2 million, but now they've now Red Bank said, listen, we'll give you an extra break. We'll only make you pay back 1.6 million on maturity. So our payment is now going to be the 1.6 million times the 10% face value of the note, which is going to give us 160,000 per year. We know that there's three years, the term of the note hasn't changed. And Remember, IFRS requires us to use the original discount rate prior to the modification of terms for consistency. So we're going to use 12% here. And this is really important. This is a difference, major difference between IFRS and ASPE. So IFRS says, listen, your I is going to be prior to the modification of terms for consistency. That's why we're using this 12%. And if we go all the way up in the question, let's just let's just highlight where that 12% is coming from. It's because this 12% was the original interest rate on the debt. And IFRS says we need to use that 12% for consistency and comparability. So that's why we use the 12% as our I. Now, when we compute the payment for our calculation, we're using the new rate because the Payment is going to be the ex exactly what's stated on the note. And at this point, the notes change. So it says 1.6 million, it says 10%. So our payment is where we take into account the new rate. But the market rate, we use the original market rate, which was 12%. Because presumably, nothing's changed in the market. All that's changed is that Trouble's having problems and Red Bank's trying to give them a break. So if we put all those inputs into our financial calculator, we'll get a present value of 1.523. 
one or one. So what? Now we need to figure out if there, what the difference is between the old debt and the new debt. So we've got old debt, sorry, 2 million. We've got new debt, which is one, five, two, three, one, four, one. So our difference is gonna be 476,859. Divide that by the 2 million, the original debt, it's going to give us 0.238 times 100 is going to give us 23.8%. So have we met the 10% threshold? Absolutely. This is definitely but bigger than the 10%, meaning that this is a substantial modification meaning that we're going to take the old debt off of our statement of financial position and put the new debt on. So we're gonna look at this as if it's a separate transaction. Okay, so let's just take a look up at the question. Remember where we're at here. Can they record a gain? If yes, calculate the gain, which we did. Prepare the journal entry to record the gain on troubled books. Okay, so the gain is going to be we're gonna have a debit notes payable. We're gonna take the old debt right off our books. Okay, so we're gonna take the $2 million debt that we had because it was about to mature at par. We had that on our balance sheet or a statement of French position. We're gonna take that off. Then we're gonna put the new debt on. We're gonna put the new debt on at the 1.6 million, the face amount of it. And the difference between those two things is going to be credit gain on restructuring debt. Terribly messy, sorry about that, which is gonna be 400,000. So now we've got a gain going through our income statement. And we've got the new debt on our balance sheet at 1.6 million and we're taking off the old debt. Now, why do we put the debt on our balance sheet at 1.6 million when we just calculated the present value of that debt at 1523141? That seems kind of bizarre, doesn't it? Because normally we always put debt on our statement of financial position at the cash flows of the debt. And that's because of the fact that the new debt is recorded at the present value of the cash flows using the current market rate. So the reason for that is because remember up here when we said, hey, important, we flagged, we recorded this, this I into our calculator, we used 12%, which was the present value of the old debt. Well, now that we know it's a brand new debt, we can ignore that 12%. And the question tells us, let's take a look. The question up here says, now assume that Red Bank reduced the principal and the market rate is currently 10%. Now what it was the rate on the debt? The rate on the debt was also 10% right here. Okay, so the new rate on the debt was 10% and the market rate is 10%. What does that mean? It means that the debt is actually again at par. So with that, so scrolling way down into our question, we've got, so if we run this present value calculation again, so in order to calculate whether it's a substantial modification or not, you have to use the interest rate on the original debt prior to any changes. We did that, we figured out we had exceeded the 10% threshold. So now when we calculate the present value of the debt, it's gonna be the exact same amount, but now our I can change to 10%. So our I, so the face of the note is 10% and the market rate or the, the note interest and the market rate is also 10%, meaning that because these two things match, the note is actually gonna be recorded at par. So again, if we ran through this exact same present value question, all we would do is change this rate to 10%. 
when we're actually putting the new debt onto our balance sheet. And that's because we're saying that rather than, this was to figure out if it was a substantial modification of terms. Now that we know it's a brand new debt, we don't need to use the original interest rate on the old debt anymore. The old debt's gone. We took it off our books. We're saying bye-bye old debt. The new debt is going to be compete. We are going to put the new debt on the statement of financial position at this present value of the cash bills. But if we ran through this exact same calculation, we change this interest rate to 10%. We, the face value of the note is also at 10%. That's how we calculated the payment. You would get the present value of the note would change to 1.6 million. And that's what we're putting in on our statement of financial position here. Let's take a look up in the question. So we've got, we've got the gain. So we recorded the journal entry for the gain, I think. Yeah. We've got how, what interest rate to trouble use to calculate its interest expense. We know that it's going to be this 10%, which we just talked about. Prepare an amortization schedule for the note. Well, if you take a look at the amortization schedule, we can do that. It's not too bad because there's no discount or premium. This note's at par. So we're going to have our dates. So we're going to have 12, 31, 20, 20, 12, 31, 21, 12, 31, 22, 12, 31, 23. And we're going to have our cash paid. We're going to have our effective interest or interest expense, interest expense, I should say. Then we're going to have the amortization and we're going to have the carrying value. So this rate is going to be the face times 10%, which is the market, which is the face amount of the note. And this is going to be the carrying value times 10%, which is the market rate. So ultimately what we're going to have is we know that the interest payment we have to make to Green Bank is always going to be 160,000. And that is the carrying amount of our note, which we put on our statement of financial position at this 1.6 million. So 1.6 million times 10% is going to give us 160,000. And our the carrying value of the note, 1.6 million times 160,000 is going to also give us an interest expense of 160,000. And there's no amortization, there's no difference between those things. So the carrying value of this note is always going to stay on our statement of financial position, 1.6 million, which is what happens when you issue a note at par. There's no discount or premium to amortize. So the note's simply going to be on your statement of financial position at par. Okay. Let's take a look up here, way up to the question. Okay, we did that. Prepare the interest payment December 31st, 2021, 2022, and 2023, and 2024. So basically it's just asking us to make the journal entries. So we're gonna have the interest payment for every year. Every year is gonna be the same because you can see the amounts don't differ as they normally would when we would have a discount or a premium that we're amortizing. So we're simply going to have debit, interest expense, credit, cash, which is going to be this 1.6 million. There's no difference. So we don't have any amount that's hitting the note payable. As you can see, the carrying value of the note payable is not changing. So that's the same entry for December 31st, 2021, 2022, and 2023. On an exam, I might write that out each period just to make sure it's very clear. But for the, our purposes here, I think you get the idea. And then the maturity of the note, which is 12, 31, 2023, or shall we say, or 1, 1, 20. 24, that was terrible, 2024, is going to simply be debit, notes payable, credit, cash, and we're simply going to pay back the face amount of the note 
and take it off our statement of financial position and say, listen, we're finally done with this note. And that's it. I think that takes us through part two. Yeah, we've done part two. So this was a very long and in-depth question related to debt restructuring. We looked at an example where there was simply a modification of the existing debt where the cash flows did not differ by more than 10% between the old debt and the new debt. And then we also saw in part two where the cash flows did differ by more than 10%, which meant that we um, had a substantial modification, meaning that we took the debt off, the, off of our statement of financial position and put the new debt back on. And if you can get through and understand these questions related to debt modification, you should be in excellent shape for any possible question that should come up on an exam.